Hello and welcome. I'm Dan Floyd with DuPont and uh, just wanted to thank you guys for joining today. Uh, our theme today is uh, patient safety. And as such, uh, what we wanna do is talk about uh, you know, a lot of different topics. One of the ones I'm gonna talk about today is a lot of the issues that are going on in the sterilization industry. There's lots of challenges that are going on. So nothing, I guess, screams patient safety if there's you know, some challenges that are affecting about 90% of how all the medical devices that are sterilized. So that's what we'll talk about today. There's a lot of issues going on with ethylene oxide. I think a lot of people have seen some of that in the news. There's also some issues with gamma sterilization. And again, these two methods make up more than 90% of uh, large scale industrial sterilization of, of medical devices. So definitely a patient safety issue. We'll talk about some of the new emerging modalities. Um, you know, can these, can any of these replace ethylene oxide? We'll talk about that. And then some of the trends on what people are doing to, uh, you know, deal with this issue. So what happened just going through some of the key dates, uh, ethylene oxide sterilization really never changed much in the last several decades. It's been pretty constant. And then 2016, the big deal was that the US EPA classified ethylene oxide from a suspected carcinogen to a known carcinogen. Now the data from that wasn't conclusive, so they do admit that it's, it's short of conclusive. There's some animal studies, but the human studies didn't, didn't really show a definitive link. But even so, that's been classified as a, as a uh, carcinogenic to humans now. So that was kind of what set the ball rolling. So in 2018, the EPA's National Air Toxics Assessment you know, basically looks at air monitoring all across uh, the US and correlated it with some higher, what looked like what was potential higher areas of cancer. Some of these areas correlated with uh, contract sterilization facilities, although a lot of these are in industrial areas. Uh, we'll talk about, there's a lot of other sources of ethylene oxide, but uh, you know that's kind of what started this whole issue. And then February, 2019 was what really kind of shook the industry up. The Illinois State EPA, uh, what started somewhat as a uh, political um, dispute, between the kind of the governor and the former governor, and there's some issues involved with that, but uh, they shut down the Sterogenics Willowbrook uh, EO facility there, which really had a huge impact on the industry. It, it, that, I mean, that facility alone dealt with 510 medical device types and over 120 medical device companies that were affected by that. And as many of you know, it, to validate a new facility to move from you know, they're in outside of Chicago, Willowbrook to, you know, wherever you're going to move to, say you're going to move to California, that is something that's going to take, you know, months to do, tons of validation work. So it's not an easy or a quick process to do. So it created uh, tons of fears of device shortages that this could really affect the medical device industry. So later that year in August through October, uh, that issue sort of moved down towards the Atlanta area. There's four different facilities that were affected there the Sterogenics facility in Georgia, two Becton Dickinson locations, and a, another contract sterilization facility uh, it's called Sterilization Services of Georgia. They were all affected by this. Many of these shut down for a period of time. And, uh, you know, you can imagine all the uh, potential issues with uh, shortages now that we're talking five to six different facilities uh, being affected by that. So there really were fears that this was going to happen in many locations all over the country. Uh, but then March, 2020, it, you know, every, everybody knows the pandemic kind of hit full force and there was huge shortages of PPE. Many of you have seen on the news where, you know, first responders and nurses, doctors were even forced to reuse surgical masks, re-sterilize those, reprocess those uh, just because there were a shortage of it. So the FDA urged the state of Georgia to allow the sterogenics facility to reopen due to a lot of the critical products that were being processed. And uh, in September, 2020, you know, these, these new expected EPA emission limits were expected to come out originally early 2020, but uh, they kept getting pushed back and pushed back obviously because of the pandemic. And then in September, 2020, they've now delayed the release until sometime probably in the next month or two, they're expected to come out with uh, these new limits, which are obviously going to affect the uh, industry greatly. And there's a lot of controversy about what those should be, how the data was assessed and the assessments that were done 
to determine that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So when you talk about uh, potential patient safety, I mean, the numbers are just enormous. There's over 2 million different medical devices listed in FDA's Global Universal Device ID database. And 40% of all those devices are sterilized. And of all the devices that are sterilized, 50% of those are sterilized with ethylene oxide, 40% are sterilized with gamma. Now this is wide scale, you know, real large sterilization, um, not what's done in hospitals. Hospital sterilization is a lot different, but you're talking 90% of all devices that are sterilized on a large scale, um, you know, are, are affected by some of the issues that we're gonna talk about. So if EO sterilization was to be banned, and they're not necessarily talking about banning it outright, but if this issue were to spread over large areas, you know, 20% of all medical devices, since 40% of all medical devices are sterilized, that's 20% of all of them would be at risk and no longer being available to patients. And that's, I mean, the number of that is just enormous. We're talking 20 billion devices just in the US every year are sterilized with ethylene oxide, 20 billion devices. So, and many of these devices can't be sterilized with alternative methods. We'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, methods that were proposed. Um, really, the, there's three main reasons why there's not an, an, another type of sterilization that can just come in and replace ethylene oxide. One is scalability. Some of these EO sterilizers can sterilize up to 30 pallets at a time. You're talking a tractor trailer, you know, huge truckload of product um, in a chamber. And so just enormous scale. Uh, availability, you know, these contract sterilization facilities are all over the U.S. And the second reason is the inability of, this, of these other sterilants to be able to penetrate into some of the hard to sterilize parts of the device or the product load itself when you box it up, put it on a pallet. In some cases, maybe it's shrink wrapped. It's just hard for some of these to penetrate as good as ethylene oxide does. Ethylene oxide is a very small molecule, so it penetrates very well. That's really, it's, it's probably its biggest advantage is its ability to penetrate through polymers and through a lot of the different plastics. And then finally, if you look at some of the other, you know, main ways to sterilize devices on a large scale radiation, there's a lot of different material compatibility issues with many devices. So uh, the kits, the custom kit business, you know, you might have 40 components, 50 components, some of those probably can't be sterilized any other way. So then the entire kit has to be sterilized with ethylene oxide. So it's, the numbers are just huge. So when you look at that, it, it's uh, the US EPA's role in this is under the Clean Air Act, they set limits on different air pollutants and ethylene oxide is considered an air pollutant. So they did a risk assessment, which was called IRIS, Integrated Risk Assessment. And they looked at uh, you know, the, the risk of cancer or things like that and what these, these emission limits should be. And many in the industry feel that it's, they use flawed science on how they came up with this. There's an alternative model that the state of Texas came up with, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, they based it, uh, both EPA and, and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, they looked at the same study that would looked at 17,500 workers in the sterilization industry. And of that, they found 53 cases of lymphoid cancer. But if you look at the EPA's model, it way over predicted the amount of, of cases that you would expect from their model, almost uh, you know more than double of what it was, almost triple of what the actual observed cases were. Uh, the Texas model actually is pretty much right on. It had 59 predicted cases and there was actually 53, so it's much closer. Uh, the EPA risk range also is, is just several orders of magnitude lower of what they're saying, the amount of EO that would cause cancer, several orders of magnitude lower than what is naturally produced in the body just through normal metabolic processes, which is you know, saying that what your body produces normally is you know, head and shoulders above what would cause cancer. So there's, there's an issue there. And it doesn't take into account that the workers were exposed to much higher levels back in, you know, back in the day, back decades ago. I started in the industry in 1992 and working in several different contract sterilization facilities. There was no respirators. The operators would drive into the chambers, load, unload the chambers right after the cycle. Uh, the ocean limits were much higher than they are today, um, you know, decades ago. So now we have PPE, the practices are better. There's lower OSHA limits. So really the risk is less than it would have been back then. So here's a couple slides that I, uh, 
took from this Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, this is the data shows, this is the normal amount, this black line here shows the normal amount of ethylene oxide produced by your body, just normally through metabolic processes, uh, through the oxidation of ethylene. And if you look at the EPA's maximum acceptable EO dose, it's way down here, well, way below the even one percentile, 40 times lower than even the first percentile of that normal amount. So you can see there's some issues with of what, what's being proposed. In addition, they looked at ethylene oxide uh, monitoring, you know, background monitoring in different locations around the country. And they found even in sites that were nowhere near any contract sterilization facilities, there was 10 to 21 times the, uh, the EPA's maximum acceptable uh, range here of 0 0.0185 micrograms per cubic meter. So, you know, it's kind of crazy that these limits would be lower than what's just normally in the background, uh, you know, miles and miles and miles away from these facilities. So uh, Advamed came out with this data here. This Advamed is basically kind of a lobbying group on behalf of the medical device industry. And they looked at the amount of EO that's produced from several different sources. You look at a school bus, can be 1 million times the amount of ethylene oxide emitted than the EPA's benchmark. If you have a charcoal grill, that would be 36 million times the amount of ethylene oxide, or even a gas generator, all the way up to 117 million times the uh, EPA's benchmark that they're looking at. So just, you know, normal car exhaust, truck exhaust um, is just, you know, crazy amounts higher than, than what that would be. So the FDA came in, so that EPA is more dealing with the air pollutants and that type of thing, the environment. FDA obviously is looking at uh, the medical device supply chain and, and patient safety. So they issued a challenge to the entire industry. And it was a two part challenge. So the first one is said, okay, can we identify new sterilization methods and technologies? So is there anything out there that can replace ethylene oxide? So 24 different companies submitted ideas and not every company that has a different type of sterilization submitted that. There's some out there that are good methods of sterilization that, that weren't submitted, but they chose, the FDA chose the following ones. And these are all great methods of sterilization, really nothing that's brand new. These have been out there for, for several years. You know, a lot of people are familiar with vaporized hydrogen peroxide, used very widely in hospitals. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is kind of a newer one, supercritical CO2. These are all great methods of sterilization and they all have great uh, applications, but uh, pretty much they're a niche-based type one. Now, accelerator-based radiation, that's probably the most promising. You have uh, E-beam and then X-ray, which X-ray has been around for a long time, but not really used on a large scale, uh, mostly due to it's, it's, it's not very efficient. It's, it's similar to E-beam, uh, but what you do is you basically put like a tantalum filter, if you will, and uh, slow down the electrons, and that releases x-rays. Um, but because x-ray can handle such a large volume of product, they can do full pallets at a time, you're seeing x-ray uh, facilities popping up all over. Um, all the major contract sterilizers are building multiple facilities. So you'll see a lot of x-ray probably coming on. That's probably the most promising to be able to take on a lot of different uh, products that are, are currently sterilized with EO, if it can stand the material compatibility issues. So these were the ones that were looked at. Uh, really, again, if you look at these, there's not one item here that could just plug in and totally replace ethylene oxide due to those three factors that I mentioned earlier. So the second part of that challenge was, okay, what can we do to reduce ethylene oxide emissions? And so if you look at this list here, many of these are dealing with looking at the EO process optimizing it, enhancing it. In a lot of cases, what they're doing is, is minimizing the amount of gas that's used, cutting the gas concentration in half. If you cut that in half, then immediately you have just half the amount of emissions there alone. Um, other people are looking at you know, only running it with a full chamber, so you're really maximizing the ethylene oxide that you are using. So again, this was a big US issue but it's also kind of spread to Europe now. So Europe is assessing ethylene oxide. In mid-December, the EU Biocidal Products Committee, they adopted a negative opinion on EO. So they're looking at things are, okay, this is a risk to health. So you know, let's, they're gonna do a negative opinion on that, but if there's nothing else that can be used, 
they have what's called a derogation or really it's just an exception uh, to that rule. And so basically, if you see here the text in red that not approving the active substance, in this case, ethylene oxide, it would have a disproportionate negative impact on society when you look at the risk to the, to the public. And so uh, this is ongoing right now. Um, so they're really trying to get this exception and most likely will because even in this final report here that you can find online, this Biocidal Products Committee report on that, in their summary, they basically state in there that there is nothing that can, re that can replace ethylene oxide at this time. So most likely they'll get an exception. Europe will still be able to use ethylene oxide. That'll be valid for five years. And then they, that can be renewed on an ongoing basis, assuming that they can justify that there is nothing else that can replace it. You know, maybe in the future something will come up. Um, so that's, that's the issue with the US and Europe on ethylene oxide. So gamma also has some issues. There's been, you know, not as, not as uh, critical as the ethylene oxide issues, but there's been uh, definitely the two biggest issues you have with gamma sterilization is both over security and then the supply. So there's an interesting article. You can Google this article here. There was a truck that was carrying uh, radioactive cobalt. So with gamma, they take cobalt 59, put it into a nuclear reactor, and it sits in there for two years, and then it, it comes out as cobalt 60, which is radioactive. That's what's used for the gamma knife procedure for cancer treatments, which used for medical device sterilization. But in 2013, some thieves stole a truck that was carrying this radioactive cobalt. And you know, they didn't necessarily know what it was, uh, probably thought it was something of value, maybe TVs or something that they could uh, sell and make money off of. But this really spiked a lot of fears of terrorism. And you know, obviously after 9-11, that's always a big concern. So, you know, they thought, well, could there be a dirty bomb? You know, they could take this radioactive material and, and do something that. So there's been a lot of calls from different governments to uh, phase out cobalt-60 in favor of things like E-beam and X-ray. In fact, there were, in 2015, there was, in Congress, so the U.S. Congress, there was legislation that was proposed to phase out cobalt-60. Now, it didn't, it failed, but, you know, there is a lot of calls for that. So we'll have to see where that goes. The second issue, you know, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal, will Tesla die for lack of cobalt? So the, the cobalt supply, because of the enormous growth of electric vehicles and batteries, this has been a big issue. Uh, two thirds of all the cobalt that they use for these applications comes from Congo, which is an unstable country. There's issues with child labor. And so, uh, you know, having all those eggs in that one basket is a concern as well. And so of the cobalt 60 that they use, you know, 80% of that's made in, in Canada and Russia. Uh, Canada used to have an old nuclear reactor that they had that had been making this, and they uh, shut that reactor down and upgraded it to a new process. So there was a, a supply issue for a while, a, a couple of years ago, but then in March 2019, this new process, this light water nuclear reactor process was developed, and the first harvest of medical cobalt-60 it was back up online in, in March of 2019. So that seems to be up and going. But this supply is always going to be an issue, especially with the enormous growth of electric vehicles, batteries, and, and things like that. So, so what's the industry doing? How are we dealing with this issue? Again, there's really not a, a replacement that's viable that you can just come in and say, okay, switch over to this method. So what a lot of companies are doing, this is a, a uh, white paper that Steris has that I found on their website. They're doing something called sustainable EO validations. Sterigenics has a similar program and most contract sterilizers are doing this. Most medical device companies are doing some type of work to optimize their current processes. So really what this involves in reducing the gas concentration, historically, uh, when I was doing EO validations for 25 years, we would always recommend you know, around 600 to 650 milligrams per liter. That's being cut in half now. People are looking at doing it all the way down to 300 milligrams per liter. And they showed a steris at a white paper that showed when they did that, they reduced that concentration all the way down. Then they were able to show the residuals on the product were also reduced in some cases by greater than 50%. So there's a big benefit there. Not only are you using half the EO, which the emissions are gonna be a lot less, but then you have a lot less fugitive emissions coming off the product because the amount that's still on the product is a lot less than it started with. Again, Sterigenics has a process called Reduce, Reuse, Reclaim. Steris is called Sustainable EO. So a lot of EO, different other contracts.
have that same process. So what are companies doing? There's a, you know, again, the FDA came in and they're looking at, you know, what can you do to your, your current process to help with this issue? So again, ethylene oxide is a gas. It has to penetrate into the product and then it has to be able to come out of the product after the cycle. So anything that can help penetration and enhance aeration is going to be critical. So FDA came out with a statement at the end of 2019. One of the items that they talked about is as soon as possible to reduce the amount of paper. So you have paper packaging, you have paper labels, you have instructions for use manuals. And you know, in some cases, these are almost like a phone book. They're in multiple languages and multiply that over 30 pallets of every product having one of these booklets in there. Then, you know, that's a large amount of ethylene oxide. So, so paper, a lot of times what it'll do, it'll, it'll absorb EO. And so in some cases, then it's going to require to have more ethylene oxide uh, into the, into the, it's going to absorb more of that. So there's less available to the product and, you know, you have to use more ethylene oxide. So that was one of the things that, that the FDA looked at to make that change. So finally, again, we, when we looked at that innovation challenge, that second part of the FDA, the summary of that is, is really the, the, the bulk of this and, and why it's a patient safety issue, there's really no viable plug-in replacement that you could do today. And this includes all of the innovation challenge winners. You look at a lot of those gaseous methods, they're, they're typically smaller, they're not available as, uh, as widely, and the scalability, you know, you can't do 30 pallets in multiple locations. And so that's, that's a big issue. The penetration uh, is another one. And, it, you know, you look at things like E-beam and X-ray can have material compatibility issues. Steam, obviously, is too hot for a lot of the plastics. So there's really nothing out there today that's going to be able to, to just replace ethylene oxide as it is. So we're going to have to monitor this. The industry is moving to minimize the amount of ethylene oxides that's used, changing in some cases the way that the validations are, are doing. So you're not doing that huge amount of overkill, which maybe gave you an eight hour cycle, you know, years ago when you validated, but maybe that cycle really only needs to be an hour and a half or an hour. Uh, you know, a lot of companies just didn't take the time to do the work to optimize that. So it was really faster just to pick a time. I'm gonna pick four hours. Yep, four hours worked and I can go on and get this validation done and put it behind me, but they didn't go back to say, hey, maybe we could have done this in uh, one hour, or maybe we could have cut the gas concentration in half. So you'll see changes to how, how these validations are done, and uh, maybe people are optimizing, only sterilizing full loads, where a lot of cases people would do minimum loads, and so you know, really trying to make it as efficient a proce as, uh, process as possible. So again, that's uh, where we're at with these two industry issues. We're gonna basically keep monitoring that. EPA is expected to come out in the next uh, you know, month or two. Hopefully we'll see what happens with that. Hopefully it's a more uh, practical approach than uh, maybe what's currently proposed. And then we'll go from there. So uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate everybody joining you know, here live from the house. I wish we could have done this anywhere else because I'm, I'm ready to go anywhere but in my house right now. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the uh, webinar.